Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and joining me are my co-hosts, Quintus, Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Luton, and Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning, Lawrence and Emily. Good morning. Good morning. Crypto industry is not a fan of Alabama this morning, but let's take a look at Bitcoin. The coin is Bitcoin price well, XVX index is currently trading at 45,969, just below that $46,000 barrier. But Bitcoin is up almost half a percent over the past 24 hours. And the Coindesk Ether price ETX index is right now 3186. ETH is up about 2%. For the day, the new DFX, Coindesk's DeFi index, is trading at 685. DeFi also up about eight tenths of a percent. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. So yes, if anyone was watching the procedural vote on the crypto compromise amendment in the $1 trillion infrastructure bill yesterday, uh, a lot of surprises, Emily. Yeah, for sure. But again, we've been talking about this all week. I still think the market's reaction is really interesting or lack thereof, you know, given like how anytime China does anything on the regulatory front, we see a market reaction. And then, you know, crypto advocates are warning that this regulatory action could essentially leave crypto to leave the United States. And the market is not only not really reacting, if anything, it's bullish. So either, you know, the market just doesn't really care about the U.S. regulatory environment or, you know, it somehow is interpreting this as a positive side because I guess regulatory clarity or the path to regulatory clarity is better than the opposite. But I find that yeah. I find it rather fascinating. Just to give folks a recap, uh, when the compromise amendment went in for a vote, it needed unanimous consent, but it was ultimately objected to by an Alabama senator who basically wanted to get 50 billion, I don't, billion. I don't know if it's yeah. a million or billion, billion, sorry about that, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, yeah. of war money in it in the in the bill, but it was objected to by Bernie Sanders. But that, that's not having much of a market effect, is it, Lawrence? No, no. Uh, but, you know, to Emily's point, this, I mean, part of the reason why we focus on China or why anything that happens in China affects crypto is in the end, uh, crypto remains, at least crypto markets remain a very Asian affair. And so the, even though the U.S. is very significant, of course, it's a significant player in crypto, it's not the it's still not the biggest player overall when it comes to continents. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the markets, uh, you know, popping up to 46, uh, 46,000 on Bitcoin. Uh, they, you know, there are things that are happening in crypto other than this regulation that's happening in, in internal affairs of uh, some of the exchanges. I'm thinking of Binance, for instance, and even some of the things happening at Coinbase where we, we, we had a, a, a recent resignation. I mean, there are a lot of things that are, that, that are very specific and, and very idiosyncratic. And, and that might be what's really affecting Bitcoin right now more than just what's happening in D.C. Fair enough. That's an important note to uh, remember. Time now to check in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing, Managing Editor Nick Day, who has been tracking this drama in D.C. very closely. He's also the editor of Coindesk's The State of Crypto newsletter, which comes out today. Hey there, Nick. So give us a play-by-play -play of what happened yesterday. Yeah, so good morning. We basically ran into Senate procedural rules yesterday. Um, after the Senate voted to, you know, advance discussion on the actual bill on Sunday night, um, Senators Pat Toomey and Cynthia Lummis announced a compromise on the crypto specific portion yesterday. And unfortunately, the only way they could have gotten it through is through unanimous consent, meaning not a normal vote, but basically running it by all 100 senators and hoping no one objected. Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama uh, asked uh, if he could attach a military spending amendment to it, uh, to which Toomey agreed. And Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont objected to the military spending portion specifically. Uh, and then shortly after that, Senator Shelby objected to the crypto provision uh, amendment. And um, yeah, that's that. Uh, Senate's going to vote on the underlying text, which is the original version we saw a week ago on the 1st. And uh, if that passes, which it is expected to, it's going to go to the House of Representatives this fall. 
That's interesting. Why would Toomey I, agree to attaching that amendment, though? So speculating, you know, the way uh, Senator Shelby brought it up, it was, you know, the words he used was, you know, uh, reserving my right to object, I think, uh, something along those lines. So it's very possible that, you know, Shelby would have objected either way. But at least this way, you know, he got an opportunity to try and, you know, attach his own thing in and, uh, you know, maybe get something through. Um, what I've heard from some of my sources is that at the end, it was really just politics. Um, you know, there was no way that uh, the Democrats were going to allow the $50 billion military, you know, rider to go through. So uh, by attaching it, you know, it kind of doomed the entire effort. So it sounds like nobody in, in, in at least on the Republican side, had, had their guys together and said, look, you know, this is, we're going to go through with this and, and let it happen. It, it sounds like it was just sort of like an ad hoc. All right, well, let's see what happens and, you know, throw caution to the wind. And, and they let Shelby object to it without getting without keeping everybody in line. And, and likewise, with the Democrats, uh, people didn't say to Sanders, OK, you know, can you just pipe down for a second while we while we deal with Shelby? Is that is that is that my understanding? Like this basically wasn't from leadership. But it was sort of like from a f- from a few senators who had an interest in in getting it done, and and it seemed to blow up in their faces. Correct? Yeah, I mean, what's really interesting is yesterday the Treasury Department actually put out a statement giving cover to Democrats and saying, you know, we're cool with this uh, compromise. We have no problems with it. We think it's a good, uh, you know, good amendment. So Democrats had you know the cover to they needed to not object. And yeah, it really came down to, you know, um, is this, uh, you know, the military thing that's been rejected repeatedly, is that going to continue going through? And the answer was no. So what are we expecting to see in the House, Nick? There is bipartisan opposition to the crypto provision in the House, but it's unclear to me whether or not that's enough to actually change it. The House also has to deal with the reconciliation bill or the, you know, the Democratic uh, budget resolution that was introduced in the Senate yesterday. Uh, There's a couple of House progressives who have said they would refuse to vote on the actual, you know, bipartisan bill unless the budget resolution is also passed. So there's going to be quite a little, uh, you know, a lot of work over the next couple of weeks, and we'll probably have a better sense of what things look like as September, uh, you know, begins. But at least for the moment, it's going to be, you know, a pretty, I don't want to say opaque, but there's going to be a lot of behind the scenes work, I imagine. The important thing is, you know, if the House does want to change it and there's enough political will to change that provision, they would probably have to find a replacement for the $28 billion that the you know Joint Committee on Taxation projected the crypto provision to bring in. So, you know, if they modify it, if they strip it, they still have to find a way to cover that hole. And that might be the, you know, big sticking point. Awesome. Well, Nick, keep us updated. Appreciate your insights. That was Coindesk Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation, Nick Day. Don't forget to sign up for the State of Crypto newsletter on Coindesk.com. Nick mentioned that there's going to be a lot of behind-the-scenes activity in the coming days, in the coming weeks. And it's a good thing we're talking to our next guest, who has been down in the trenches of D.C. lobbying lawmakers to recognize crypto innovation. Joining us now is Perian Boring, President of the Digital Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to the show, Perian. So you've been talking talking to lawmakers. I guess no one got around to Alabama Senator Shelby in time for not to tell him not to object to this amendment. Yeah, this was definitely a long shot. Um, I've said this uh, many times before, but about 2% of legislation ever introduced actually becomes law. And the amendment, although it was an incredible feat to get both those groups of senators to come together on something that everyone can support. In addition, it had the backing of the White House and the Treasury. Even with all of those factors of this compromise amendment, it was still a massive boulder to get unanimous consent. Uh, A lot of people were surprised by that. I don't think we should have been surprised. I think there were a lot of things we saw that happened on the floor of the Senate over the past couple of days that really should not have been surprising. Uh, Remember, it's the senators that control the process of how things move forward. And there's many, many 
parts of this process that we in the industry as outsiders have very little control over. So ultimately, it did not pass unanimous consent. Uh, the clock runs out around 11 a.m. today. So there's about two hours left that maybe something could happen. They could, they could try again if they want to, although that's highly unlikely. But this was not um, a surprising scenario, but it was very disappointing. Perry, and now we're going to move on to the House. Um, and so, you know, one of the reasons this didn't pass is issues that had nothing to do with crypto, right? Senators had other issues that they prioritized more. And then, as you said, there were procedural issues. But I guess the bigger question, and this is something that I don't understand, is, you know, when we get to the House or even going forward, what would spur representatives to spend any political capital on crypto, right? I mean, obviously, there's a handful of, of senators that are, you know, this is really their issue and, and, and they're really into it. I get that. But for other people, you know, you have limited political capital, right? And you have your own issues and your, your own constituents. So, like, how do you get them to see crypto as, as a priority? Well, where we were successful in the Senate is through education for those who really understand it. And I think Senator Wyden was really just an amazing champion for our community through this whole process. And if you look at the tweets that he put out over the past several days, uh, the way that he had criticized that Portman Amendment uh, and the War Warner Amendment that specifically called out proof of stake and that was criticized in terms of creating winners and losers. And he got into, into that and the nuances of the statements he, he was making on Twitter. When people and our, our elected officials really understand how this technology works, it's when we're, that, that is what gives us the absolute best position as an industry to move things forward. So I continue to think education is our biggest tool. At the Chamber, we launched an initiative last year called Crypto for Congress. We built that specifically for our elected officials. Um, in that, we have toolkits for uh, members of Congress and their campaign pains to start using Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. I think the best way for people to understand this technology is to have a hands-on experience. And the Crypto for Congress initiative gives people the opportunity to do that. So again, education is the most important thing at this time. And that is hard work. There's nothing that can replace that. Yeah, I agree with you on the education point. I guess the question is, is how do you move from sort of education to prioritization, right? Because all of these representatives, they have so many other issues that they need to fight for and that they need to spend political capital on. So like, how do you convince them that crypto is something that they should go to bat for? Like education is like the first step, right? Like how do you get to the yeah. second step on that? That's always been an issue. You know, we, we founded the chamber in 2014. We've been at this for eight years. And even those who do understand it, you have to make sure they have, they have the will to want to move it forward. We have been able to build many, many, many champions throughout Congress. We've met a lot of new ones in the Senate over the past couple of weeks. And we saw with the Congressional Blockchain Caucus just yesterday, they sent, a, they, they issued a letter really stating their interest in supporting our community on this issue. So winning champions, it, it, it takes it takes time to do that, but I think it really comes down to one them understanding not only how the technology works, but how important it's going to be for the future of our economy. And once they get there, it's really hard not to want to take action. Ariana, as, as Emily just said, the, the the House now gets this, and are you keeping track of who's who would most likely be for it? against it and who has to be turned or who has to be swayed? Do you have a, a column, three columns on a piece of paper somewhere? And if so, how, what are the numbers on those? Yeah, the bigger, I think, battle or just boulder will have to roll up the hill on the House side comes back to politics and procedure. Um, at this time, it's not clear if the House is going to open up this bill and allow for an amendment process at all. Is it possible there could be a big fight to allow that process to open up? Possibly. However, we do have to understand that Democrats have majority in both the Senate and the House right now. So again, they control the process. And uh, it's very likely that the White House and Treasury will put uh, a very strong indication on Democrats to not allow this but to go through a procedure where they can open it up. I think that's the bigger challenge is procedure as opposed to who's for it and against it. Right now, it's not clear what that looks like. It is a it is a thin majority, though, and that and and Secretary Yellen did put out a statement 
basically saying they were that she was down with, uh, with with the compromise the Senate was working on. So could we possibly see, if not, you know, overt uh, a compliance, at least from the part of the Treasury, at least some help or at least a, a tacit nod that, OK, you know, this is a fair compromise to get done, given the, ra- the razor thin margin that the Democrats do have in, in the House that it would work. And if so, then wouldn't it make sense to at least keep track of who who's for, who would mo- most likely be for it and who most likely be against it and who kind of is in the middle that needs to to say, hey, you know, this 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 is a great compromise. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. We stated yesterday that we, we you know, given the absence of this amendment uh, passing and being left with the base tax, which we do have concerns over, we're, we are looking at any and all and every option to ensure the industry has the clarity it needs on what's in and what's out, who's considered a broker and who's not. And there's a lot of tools there. There's, there's opportunities on the House side. Um, of course, really where the clarity comes from is in the regs themselves. So working very closely closely with IRS and Treasury, where all of these details will be fleshed out between now and 2023 when this goes into implementation. That's real. the real details are going to be. So uh, being a part of that process is also critically important. Um, and then also, I just want to highlight that last night, Senators Portman and Senators Warren delivered a colloquy, which that will go into the legislative record and will become part of the history of this piece of legislation. And they did clarify that their intent is for the scope of this provision to not extend to miners, to validators, to stakers, to other consensus mechanisms that may be developed or invented in the future, and also the sellers of hardware and software. So there's already things that are being delivered and provided by the Senate and also indications that we've gotten from Treasury and White House that these concerns that we have been uh, bringing awareness to over the past several weeks um, are going to be a, a addressed and everyone's aware of them. And there's you know, multiple public statements and also legislative history and record that has been provided uh, to state the intent of Congress on that. So there are some si- si- uh, silver linings here. Of course, you know, legislative history is not as strong as having legislative text, um, but uh, we do have some very strong indications of the direction this is going to go when it goes into implementation. Mm-hmm. And so, and just to give folks a recap, the, this provision in the infrastructure bill has a definition for broker that could potentially include or be interpreted to include miners, uh, node operators, validators, and such. And so that these lawmakers are expressing their intent to exclude those people is good in the uh procedural record. Nevertheless, this original language will likely go through, do you think, Perianne, through the Senate, through the House? And uh, if so, or if not, how do you see things playing out? Yeah, again, we have about two hours left on the clock in the Senate. They could try to push for unanimous consent on this amendment. Again, that's highly unlikely. What what we'll likely see today is the base text be voted on, adopted by the Senate, go to the House. Again, it's still unclear um, what uh, the House is going to do with this bill. It's unclear if they're going to allow an opportunity for amendments or not. There's some who will be pushing for that. Um, but really, more importantly, uh, this will go to the IRS to write regulations and to provide the framework for information reporting on digital assets. And that's where all of the details are going to be. So really, it's that reg process that's going to be instrumental to ensure that the IRS and Treasury gets this right and to get it workable. And remember, it was Treasury's idea to do this back in May of, of this year in the, in the Green Book um, that they published. Information reporting for digital assets was one of the things that they I. Uh, you know, show that they had intentions of doing. So Treasury and White House both have an invested interest in getting this right. So there are some uh, silver linings here, uh, but the process is not over and there's still a lot more engagement and education and advocacy that needs to happen. All right, Perry, I appreciate fun- you coming on the show. Lawrence has one more. Oh no! Are you are, are you finding that you're you're having to educate uh, the people in the crypto community about the political process as much as you're <laughs> having to educate people in the 
in, yeah, in DC absolutely. about crypto. <laughs> yeah, again, I think a lot of people were surprised by a lot of the things we saw on the Senate floor over the weekend and even up until yesterday. Again, these things really shouldn't mm-hmm. have been a surprise. So it's also been, I think, a lesson for many people in the community who are starting to kind of wake up and understand that public policy and what happens in Washington can have a huge impact on the future of our industry and the success of businesses that want to operate here. So it's in the industry's best interest to be educated on how public policy works and to be engaged and to be a part of the process to make sure we have a voice at the table and to make sure ultimately what comes out is something that promotes the development and innovation of blockchain technology further. All right, Perian, we got to wrap it there, but thank you for your work and thanks for sharing thanks your so inside knowledge on the show. That was Digital Chamber of Commerce President Perian Boring coming up, checking in on Asia and the crypto markets update with financial management consultancy, helping us. Time now for the daily forecast, an update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Angie Lau of Forecast News. Welcome to the daily forecast, August 10th, 2021. I'm Angie Lau, editor in chief of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain. Coming up, a special edition of the daily forecast where we are covering all things NFTs. Coming up, Hong Kong artists embracing NFTs. K-pop fans await more NFT drops and book your next holiday timeshares via, you guessed it, NFTs. Let's get you up to speed on NFTs from Asia to the world. NFTs, or non-fungible tokens, love them or hate them, they apparently aren't going anywhere. Now NFTs are redrawing the art scene in Asia as more artists are embracing the technology. Forecast News' Lucas Caccioli is in Hong Kong with more. Gus Zabo also known as Zabotage, is a Hong Kong-based artist. The lucky cat for me is just so Hong Kong. But when the artist, along with his wife and business partner, Hannah Zabo, were told about NFTs by a longtime collector friend, they thought, why not give it a try? And he basically just explained it all to us and how kind of it was really taking off. And we just kind of thought, wow, this really sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now Zabotage has a new canvas digitally designing works and transforming them into non-fungible tokens. I, I see the potential there of, you know, writing history uh, with, 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 you know, where it's, it's reaching the highest prices at Christie's for a, an NFT being sold or, um, you know, just coming up with something revolutionary to NFTs. You know, there, there's so much opportunity there on the playing field, so uh, I'm ready to explore it even further. Exploring it further while creating new business opportunities, like his traditional canvas works, a Zabotage NFT will tell a story and be sold for a price. If you can get some sort of emotion from uh, a physical piece of artwork or an NFT po- uh, piece of artwork, digital artwork, um, then, then that's worth its weight. It's, it's, it's how much value you see in that. The real value may not be in the actual artwork though, rather in the token that connects your name with the artist's work on the blockchain. NFTs are not the art. Right. NFTs are the certificate of authenticity of the NFTs. Valentina Lafredo is a visual artist who has been based in Hong Kong for 15 years. Lafredo's works consist mostly of photography, but she's been experimenting with other media. She first learned of NFTs on the popular social media app Clubhouse. The part about like blockchain was very uh, fascinating, really exciting to kind of experience this moment where there is this disruptive technology that can change the world. Her knowledge on the subject grew, and soon after she began experimenting with the technology. For me, it's a technology that gives authenticity, gives provenance, gives transparency to digital art, which changed the game completely for digital art. For Forecast News, I'm Lucas Caccioli, Hong Kong. 
Meanwhile, in South Korea, the entertainment industry is sparing no effort to race into the world of NFTs. Forecast News reporter and resident K-pop expert Timmy Shen with more now from Taipei, Taiwan. When it comes to merchandise, K-pop fans will buy just about anything from t-shirts to photo cards. They're so invested into the success of these groups that they follow that they're, they're willing to really pay a lot of money on merchandise. NFTs seem the natural choice for the industry indeed. JYP Entertainment, one of South Korea's top entertainment conglomerates, which saw a drop of 7% in its total revenue last year, recently unveiled a plan to partner with blockchain company Doonamu to set up an NFT platform dedicated to K-pop. There could be a long way to go, however, as some fans told Forecast News, they still prefer items they can hold. For Forecast News, I'm Timmy Shan, Taipei, Taiwan. And finally, NFTs aren't just for investing in art or music. You can even use them to invest in holiday resorts. Labs Group, a real estate investment platform powered by blockchain, says it is the world's first community-owned project fractionalized into rewarding timeshare, or RTS. NFTs. The NFTs representing days on the calendar year were auctioned off with the intention of making investments in such resorts open to everyone. And that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Until the next time. The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. Time for a live look at Bitcoin. The coin is Bitcoin price XVX index currently trading at $45,910. Bitcoin is up about two tenths of a percent for the day. And the coin is Ether price ETX index right now at $3,181. ETH is up 2% over the past 24 hours. And the new DFX coin is DeFi index trading at $690. DeFi is up about 4.5%. And joining us now to discuss the crypto markets is Octavio Marenzi, CEO and founder of financial management consultancy Opimus. Welcome to the show, Octavio. So when you see the crypto markets rising as they are, do you see this as a sustainable momentum or and what is the catalyst behind it? Well, I must say, I woke up this morning feeling pretty good about the crypto space, but listening to the, to the three of you talk about the infrastructure bill, I sort of developed a mild depression, thinking things look really bleak and awful as a result of this provision not going through. And it was fascinating to listen to this arcane procedures that exist in the Senate that I wasn't aware of it at all. Um, I think within the infrastructure bill, actually, there, there is a huge, huge silver lining for crypto. And it's not just a silver lining, it, it's basically... Uh, is something that's going to give a lot of impetus to the crypto market in the coming months and years, is this enormous amount of spending that they're planning on doing. Now, what's supported crypto a lot over the course of the past year or so has been this enormous wall of cash and sort of the debasing of, of fiat currencies of the dollar, the euro, the yen, basically everything. And that has driven a lot of money into crypto. Now, it's been an uneven ride on occasion. It's gone up and down quite severely here and there. I think overall that is the trend. So more spending is very, very positive for crypto overall because a lot of that spending is going to have to be monetized. The central banks are going to print more money to make that work and, and governments don't want to raise taxes to make that happen. So they're going to print money to make that happen and that's going to favor crypto, which of course is sort of immune to that kind of inflationary pressure and that kind of expansion of the money supply. So I think I think that's why we're seeing Bitcoin shoot up and we saw it go up quite a few percent uh, as soon as this this infrastructure bill was looked like it was going to pass. And this whole discussion about what is a broker and what is not not a broker and is a miner or a transaction facilitator a broker and therefore subject to certain ar arcane tax rules really doesn't matter. I think it's the spending that's going to be important, the increase in the money supply that's going to come with it, and that's very, very good for crypto. So, uh, Octavia, we should... I'm glad we could bring a little bit of bleakness to, to your day. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, with the with the infrastructure bill, though, I mean, this is this is the big question. Like, that's a really interesting interpretation about spending. We actually haven't really heard that on the show so much. But I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, is that really what was happening? Like people were interpreting the infrastructure bill that way? Or is it more that the infrastructure bill just was kind of irrelevant in what's happening in the market? And there are other forces that are driving the price up. Like, you know, maybe it had to do with the Ethereum hard fork or, or, or other things that are happening behind the scenes. It's like not clear to me that it's even really having an impact on the market. 
it, it might be right. I mean, human beings, of course, very good at finding cause and effect where there is none. And so uh, perhaps that's the trap of falling into here. But no, I, I think I think the amount of spending that this infrastructure bill brings with it is really going to be very favorable to, to the crypto market overall. And I, I think if you look at sort of the timing of the jump that we saw just over the course of the past few days and hours of, of in Bitcoin sort of speaks to that more than anything. So I, I think, yes, it is having an impact and there's more spending coming later on. So the, the overall budget looks like it's going to be massively in deficit. Uh, and that, is, of course, is going to have to be monetized. And I, I think those things are, are favorable for, for cryptocurrencies overall, and Bitcoin in particular. So I think I think it looks very, very favorable. The, the next the next few years, or the next couple of years, I think we're going to continue down that path. Octavia, we, we, uh, last week we saw these big moves in, in between wallets in, in the crypto space. This is a question that I've I've been asking various people in in the markets, and so far. Uh, there's no clear answer as to why you had these large wallet moves prior to uh, the spike or as, as prices were going up on, on a low volume day. It seemed like there was kind of a, it, it didn't quite make sense. Uh, granted, volumes are up a little bit on the exchanges, but why, are, why did we see some of these moves happen at a time when, for instance, Binance, um, Binance is having issues with, with its ability to, to trade. It's, it's shutting down certain aspects of its trading, uh, lowering leverage, et cetera. Why are we seeing all this happening um, in, in the markets right now? Well, I, I can't speak to the individual wallets and why money was moved out of one and into another. But I think with Binance changing things like its leverage capabilities, people might be looking to put that money someplace else and say, I need to put my money someplace else where I can get that leverage and parking that money there. But that's a very cursory explanation. I mean, I, I you really can't say it's all a bit opaque, of course, uh, in, in terms of the reasons for those movements. But I would imagine that some people were looking at this and saying, I need to get my, my, my wallet in some sort of jurisdiction where I'm not going to be subject to such tight and, and constrained regulations and, and moving that around. But who knows? It might have just been an absolutely normal trading activity, some, some large players moving money back and forth. It's impossible to say. All right. Javier, we'll leave it there. But thank you for coming on the show and offering your insights. That was Opima's CEO, CEO, Octavio Morenzi. Coming up, what does the U.S. infrastructure bill mean for crypto firms? We ask crypto custodian Bitco. That's coming next. From fueling local economies to connecting global markets, the future of money is taking shape now. Crypto State by Coindesk will bridge communities of crypto investors, thought leaders, and developers to tell the global story of decentralized finance. Join us for this virtual event series as we make stops in Israel, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates to dive into the movements that are disrupting markets and changing communities. Register today. The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. Well, crypto firms are weighing in on what this latest infrastructure bill could mean for their business. Our next guest is the chief compliance officer at crypto custodian Bitco, which recently just banged out an over $1 billion deal to be acquired by Galaxy Digital. Joining us now is Jeff Horowitz. Welcome to the show, Jeff. So when taking a look at these enhanced reporting requirements laid out in this U.S. infrastructure bill that potentially expands the definition of a broker in the crypto industry, does it impact your business at all? Um, yes and no. It's a very broad definition of anybody who moves crypto uh, versus, you know, the way Jack Dorsey put it, somebody who's involved in exchanging crypto and fiat. Uh, we don't do that piece of it. That's more for exchanges. But uh, broadly written and broadly interpreted could mean that counterparties that are not uh, in the middle of these transactions may have some reporting obligations, which really would be impossible for us because we don't have a cost basis of people who sent crypto in or sent crypto out. So we're going to continue to have that conversation with legislators and regulators to better define what they mean by broker. So how what do you handle it then? Over the past, uh, sorry, go ahead, Lars. Go ahead. So, so how do you handle it then? I mean, it, it, is there another way for you guys to profit over what's happening in D.C. right now? Or do you think that these kind of regulations would be so onerous that you might have to to swear or or uh, change your business model? 
Yeah, I think we still need to see how this will actually get written into legislation and Treasury will have to define that. And then we'll figure out, does that affect any of the broader crypto uh, infrastructure and markets, in- including uh, custodians like us? I don't see it as a um, day one issue for us. Um, but uh, as we've seen this week, really broad and not narrowly defined definitions can mean a lot. And to put a bill out there and figure it out later is not the best way to go about uh, defining sensible regulation. We've had ongoing conversations with Treasury and regulators for you know two years now, but I think we still have more to do on the education front. Um, one of the larger narratives of crypto over the past year has been the role of institutional investors, and I think that's something you have a little bit of insight into. Um, how, what is the status of that? Are you still seeing more institutional money coming in? Do you feel like that's still a, a very strong force in the crypto world? Absolutely. We um, are, are seeing more institutional adoption, more customers coming to us and wanting to uh, custody with us and then explore other products and services uh, through the use of uh Bitco as their main custodian. Um, I think the price increase is really not about the legislative discussions we've had this week, but about broader crypto adoption for the institutional markets. I think every week you see a new mainstream uh, company uh, getting involved in this. And uh, we're excited to see where institutional adoption is going to go throughout the rest of the year. So, Jeff, Bitco is no stranger to politics. The U.S. government recently yanked Bitco's hard-won deal to be the custodian of cryptocurrency seized by the U.S. government, and the contract was handed to Anchorage, a smaller competitor based on a technicality, which is that Bitco Bitco is simply too big to win a small business contract, but not really concerned? Look, so we won the the first uh, bid on that, and it was awarded to us. There are some technical Uh, challenges of who can be considered a small business. And the interpretation of that actually disqualified us. And there were protests about us winning the bid. Um, I've heard that Anchorage, who won the bid after us, has also had uh, complaints or protests against their uh, bid. Uh, You know, uh, if you're going to give somebody billions of dollars to custody, I don't think you want to award that to a small business just because that's the way the government has structured some of their bidding process. So we'll see how this plays out. Uh, We were honored that we were chosen as the safest place for the government to store their crypto. Um, We'll see how it plays out in the long run. And maybe they put this bid back out, not under the Small Business Administration requirements. So Jeff, along the lines of what I asked Octavio, uh, you're seeing, are you seeing any large movements internally as well uh, among wallets? Are you seeing rather unusual sizes being moved back and forth uh, for any reason uh, over the past few days? No, n- nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, those would be more movements from exchanges to to uh, other other places. But for us, we're just seeing more institutions wanting to bring in um, crypto assets. And, and custody in a safe environment with a regulated crypto custodian. So that trend just keeps going up. Uh, our sales team is receiving more calls than they, you know, uh, on a day can really um, handle. And we're we're deciding, you know, who are the biggest players in the space, and how do we scale quickly to be able to uh, take advantage of this increased adoption. All right, Jeff, we've got to wrap up. But before we do, I understand you're a former Coinbase executive. They're about to release earnings today. Uh, Any thoughts? Uh, Look, uh, we're in a crypto bull market. I think Coinbase is doing well as a company. Their stock was up yesterday. I am interested, like everybody else, to see what their earnings report at the end of the day is. But it's great for the crypto economy. Uh, The more companies that are in the space and are doing well continues to make our conversation mainstream just like it was all week today, uh, all week about the infrastructure bill. So uh, I was uh, proud to have worked at Coinbase and I'm excited to see how the entire crypto economy grows. Awesome. Jeff, thanks for coming on the show. That was Go Chief Compliance Officer Jeff Horowitz. Time now to check in with Crypto Twitter with our tweet of the day. This one coming in from Minnesota Representative Tom. Oh, pardon me. There is no tweet of the day for today, but do go on to crypto Twitter and check out the latest from Representative Tom Ember. The fight still lives on in the U.S. House of Representatives. All right, that's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily Parker and Lawrence Luton. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with all about Bitcoin. Coming up at noon is The Hash. You're watching Coindesk TV.